This is the wind pathway in C. elegans and Xenopus embryos. Uh, today we'll be talking about what the wind pathway is and how it affects the early embryonic development of these two model organisms. Now wind signaling is actually used in the development of many species and can be seen conserved throughout the multiple model organisms that we are showing today such as C. elegans and Xenopus. Uh, shown above is the general pathway of wind signaling which begins actually with wind ligand or some sort of ligand binding to the frizzle, frizzled receptor on the cellular membrane. This activates a protein called the shovel. Now the activity of the shovel is actually to block the activity of GSK3 kinase in the cytoplasm. Uh, GSK3 kinase uh, phosphorylates beta catenin which marks it for degradation and also does not obviously allow it to enter the nucleus. Right? So since the shell was activated, GSK3 kinase is uh, repressed. That means beta catenin can enter the nucleus. After beta catenin has entered the nucleus, it can now bind to TCF, which then those two form a transcriptional activator. Uh, without beta catenin in the nucleus, Groucho actually bounds to TCF and that's a transcriptional repressor. Now that I've introduced to you what the general wind pathway looks like, uh, we will see an action in specific model organisms starting with uh, C. elegans. So this is a map of the C. elegans embryo in its early developmental stages going from the zygote all the way to an 8 cell stage. So the important thing to note is at the 4 cell stage, there is 4 cells called ABA, ABP, P2, and EMS. And if you see, if you look at the difference between the 4 cell and the 8 cell stage, the EMS cell actually divides into two daughter cells called MS and E. Now, if MS and E are actually allowed to develop by themselves autonomously as uh, if no cell-cell interaction can take place, uh, both those cells will adopt a MS-like fate, uh, which kind of implies that MS and E are different because of some sort of cell-cell interaction or cell-cell signaling. Now this cell-cell signaling actually comes from the contact between P2 in the 4-cell stage and the posterior end of EMS. What's shown here is actually a flowchart of some transcriptional regulators in C. elegans and if you can note MED1 and 2 is actually present in the EMS cell and interestingly enough MED1 and 2 activates both TBOX35 and N1 and 3 in MS and E respectively. Now something must occur to where cells from the same source which is EMS in this case end up expressing different genes to specify different fates, which is uh, MS versus E. So wind signaling actually plays a role in differentiating the MS and E cells. Uh, as you can see here, wind signaling is actually present uh, from P2 to the posterior side of EMS. Now looking at the flowchart on the right, uh, MOM2, which is actually uh, wind ligand and MOM5 which is the frizzled receptor are both a part of the general wind pathway shown previously and we see their name from their mutant phenotypes uh, so more of MS okay. so this pathway points specifically to the role of wind signaling in repressing the MS fate if wind signaling is not present between P2 and EMS both anterior and posterior halves of EMS will develop into MS like cells so the wind pathway is actually specifically used to signal worm 1 and lit 1 to phosphorylate POP1 protein in the nucleus of the cell. This results in transportation of phosphorylated POP1 to be transported out of the nucleus and interact with a beta catenin protein called cis1. So the polarization of MS and E cells can actually be observed by the higher levels of POP1 in the MS cell versus the lower levels in the E cell due to the worm 1 slash lit 1 phosphorylation. Lower levels of unphosphorylated POP1 in the nucleus reduces its ability to repress E-like development 
and POP1 slash SIS1 also contributes to the activation of E fate, determining factor N1 and 3. So now we will look at the wind signaling in Xenopus embryos. So for a little background, Xenopus embryos actually undergo something called cortical rotation uh, during normal embryonic development, and this is shown above. Uh, this is when the animal cells, which is the top half, uh, right where the sperm entry point is in the dark shaded area, um, actually rotate down towards the vegetal pole, which is the unshaded half of the embryo. Now this is done with the activity of microtubules and if the activity of microtubules is disrupted by the application of UV lights, cortical rotation will actually not occur. Now, interestingly enough, when cortical rotation does not occur, the embryo does not develop any dorsal structures and is eventualized. So evidence uh, for the role of the WIMP pathway in developing dorsal structures in the Xenopus embryo is actually shown above. Right? If you inject WENT or disheveled or beta catenin or dominant negative GSK3 mRNA into the future ventral site, it will actually cause the development of a secondary dorsal axis which is shown to the right. And you can see how there, this Xenopus embryo is actually uh, contains two dorsal structures, which is the head, eyes, neural tube, stuff like that. And also, the hyperdorsalization caused by treating embryos with lithium chloride uh, also has uh, ectopic nuclear localization of beta catenin. Now, this is important because if you recall the UN pathway, uh, beta catenin needs to be able to enter the nucleus to interact with TCF and create a transcriptional act. So what does cortical rotation actually have to do with uh, specifying dorsal structures through the WIMP pathway? So looking at the first picture on the left, uh, the shell of protein is actually contained in vesicles uh, located at the vegetal pole. Now it's important to note that this disheveled protein is actually not zygotic in nature and is actually de deposited there by the mother. Now if we recall, the shell in the WIMP pathway is an anti-GSK3 protein that prevents GSK3 from phosphorylating beta catenin to initiate its degradation. Now during cortical rotation, these vesicles containing the shell protein are actually moved to the future dorsal side of the embryo and is able to stabilize beta catenin at the future dorsal side. So this image above actually shows a couple of stages after cortical rotation has actually occurred. And as you can see, beta catenin is actually established in a gradient with the highest concentration at the future dorsal side. Uh, maternal veg T and veg 1 is also present in the gradient at the vegetal pole of the embryo. The overlap of beta catenin and veg T and veg 1 creates an area of high nodal related protein expression. Now, high nodal related protein expression specifies the nucleus center, uh, which induces the spemen organizer just above it in the future dorsal side. So, just to recap, <laughs> beta catenin with veg team veg one specifies a high level of nodal related proteins, which then goes along to specify the organizer. Whereas veg team veg one by themselves, without beta catenin. Uh, specifies only a low amount of nodal related proteins and that goes on to specify the ventral mesoderm. Now the spemen organizer is required for the proper development of dorsal structures and also interacts with the WIMP pathway. Uh, I'll be in a different manner than what has been shown so far. So stage 8 and stage 9 actually show what we have already gone over uh, which is high levels of nuclear beta catenin with veg T veg 1 uh, specify a <clears throat> high level of nodal related proteins. Right? The area where the concentration of nodal related proteins is actually the highest specifies the nucleus center which then uh, goes on to induce the organizer in the future dorsal side. Now interestingly enough looking at stage 10 the organizer actually expresses weight antagonists which is frisbee Right? and also BMP antagonists. Right? Now this can seem a little contradictory but it can be explained by the timing of events in the developing Xenopus embryo. 
So in the early embryo, before gastrulation, uh, the specification of the organizer requires the WIMP pathway to stabilize beta-catenin, but after the mid-blastula stage, when the organizer has already been specified, the zygotic expression of WIMP proteins, in this case uh, XWIMP8, is used to specify ventral mesoderm. To ensure the proper development of dorsal mesoderm, the organizer secretes WIMP or MBMP antagonists. Um, in the Xenopus development, the WIMP pathway is used to solve problems of specification in multiple different situations and at multiple different times. Uh, this is also seen widely in the development of other species as well. So Xenopus embryos also use WIMP signaling to properly specify the dorsal dermomyotome domain of the somite, which goes on to become dermis and trunk muscle. So this is another example of how the WIMP pathway is used to solve a different issue other than what we have seen before. So to sum up, the wind pathway in C. elegans and Xenopus embryos is used in cell-cell signaling to differentiate cells and induce the development of structures that would otherwise not be specified for if these cells were allowed to develop autonomously. So it's important to keep in mind that the wind pathway can be used at different times and at different locations to ensure proper development and the examples that were shown here are just a small sample of what it can be used for.